From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FPNA Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy, and you are listening to FPNA Today. FPNA Today is brought to you by Data Rails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis and discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FPNA. We will provide you with actionable advice about the financial planning and analysis world. This is going to be your go-to resource for everything FPNA. I'm thrilled to welcome today's guest on the show, Anders Lou Lindbergh. Welcome to the show, Anders. Thanks a lot, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here, and I've been been following the the launch of this podcast and all the great people you've had on it uh, so far. So I feel there's a lot to live up to, and I'll see if I can deliver. I'm sure you'll do a great job. Well, why don't you start by maybe just telling us a little bit about yourself? Let our audience know who you are. I'm guessing most of them already know if they're on LinkedIn, but there's why don't you a, give us a little rundown about yourself? No, absolutely. And I guess there, there's a good chance that they do, Paul. So my name is Anders Lee Lindbergh. As you mentioned, I'm a partner at a company called Business Partnering Institute. And here we help FP&A teams across the world becoming better at influencing business leaders with all the hard work that they have done on their analysis, which uh, can be kind of challenging for, for a lot of FP&A professionals. So that, that's what we do. And of course, I'm uh, also very uh, active on LinkedIn, just like yourself, uh, Paul, and sort of see myself as as, as a, not just an FP&A leader or someone that's active on LinkedIn, but really someone that's trying to, uh, let's say, be a, be a trailblazer for the FP&A community um, and leading the way in many different different ways, and I've really been really been pleased and, and excited to see how the FPNA community has grown in the past couple of years. Uh, so that's 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 really something that that excites me. But I uh, I publish uh, two newsletters on uh, on LinkedIn. One is called Trends in Finance and Accounting. The other one is called Here's the Future of FPNA and Business Partnering. And I publish content every day to my more than 100,000 followers on LinkedIn. I also just recently launched my own podcast called the Hashtag Finance Master Podcast, which is available on all channels as well. So lots of exciting content and news coming to uh, FPNA professionals across the world. Hey, no, you definitely have a lot of content. And you mentioned, you know, 100,000. I know you recently crossed that milestone. I saw that. So congratulations Thank there. You. And maybe we can start with just telling us a little bit about how this journey began, right? I mean, you've built quite a following. Obviously, when you started, you weren't known. You were working in corporate America like the rest of us. And so how did you know how did you get started on LinkedIn? What was the impetus to do that? And just take us a little bit through that journey. Yeah, it's it's funny you mentioned the corporate America, Paul, right? Because I, I'm based in Denmark, right? So I'm based in Europe. But actually my LinkedIn journey did start in corporate America because I was working <laughs> in uh, I was working in the US at the time of I was having a, a, a stint in, in Houston, Texas for two and a half years. And, and while I was sitting over there working as a finance manager, uh, it was first first time I had a leader job, first time I had my own office. And uh, <laughs> I just sort of felt like, you know, the work, I could sort of manage that uh, manage that pretty well. But I, I, I sort of got very inspired around, you know, creating, uh, you know, plans and, and transformations and ways of working. And I thought to myself, hey, why not try to also do some sort of personal branding, writing about what I do and getting engaged with lots of different uh, people that are interested in the same thing. So already back in 2012, so 10 years ago, I started sharing content on LinkedIn, if you can call it like that back then, which meant I found different kind of interesting content on sites like CFO.com, for instance, and then I would share that in some groups on, on LinkedIn and see if anyone wanted to engage with that. I was also blogging at, uh, on, on some other sites as well. So I started my, my content creation journey all the way back in 2012. And uh, it's, it's funny, you know, I, I still track my LinkedIn data to this day, but back then I was also tracking my, my LinkedIn data and it was pretty, uh, it's pretty poor numbers compared to what, what, what you would look at today. Um, but, but then in 2014, in May, LinkedIn opened up its uh, blogging platform. It was pretty new back then to the general public. And since I'd already started sharing some content and writing a few blogs in other places, I thought, hmm, I'm going to jump on this train and see where it takes me. So I started publishing in May 14, once a week. In the beginning, I didn't really know what to write about from week to week. You know, a thought would appear in my mind and I'm just going to write about that. But over you know a matter of six months, I think I started 
started to get into the to the swing of things. I also got picked up by a few LinkedIn editors, so they would promote my content a little bit. It didn't mean I went viral with hundreds of thousands of views on different stuff by any means, but it was nice to get that kind of recognition. So I continued to publish uh, weekly for, uh, for, for a good number of years. It became more and more finance focused, you know, not just writing about everything, but really finance focused. I started to write content in series rather than just standalone blog posts. All this stuff, right? It just basically helped to build my my presence and my brand on, on LinkedIn. And then in uh, in 2017, I sort of broke the algorithm and had several posts go for more than 100,000 views. I think the, the biggest one was like 415,000. And in a matter of six months, I connected with like 9,000 people. And then I just continued it from, from there. So in 2018, I launched my first newsletter, uh, which was a part of, I was a part of the pilot there uh, on LinkedIn. 2019, I launched the second one. I was the first in Denmark to do a LinkedIn Live. Uh, so it's kind of like just grew from there. But the key to the whole thing was the the consistency. You know, starting doing something and then building on top of that. Once you could keep that running, you build on top, keep that running, build on top. And, you know, today we still have two newsletters running. Now we just launched a podcast. We're doing weekly LinkedIn audio shows. So it's just about being consistent and giving value back to the community. And then people want to uh, to hear more. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit about your journey. And I didn't realize it had quite been 10 years. I knew it was somewhere back in that time, but it's amazing how quick it goes. And it shows, like you said, the uh, what can happen when you're consistent and you provide value. And I know a lot of your content, you provide a lot of great value. So you had mentioned, you know, that the FP&A community is growing a lot on LinkedIn. So you're seeing a lot more content out there. So what do you think that means for the state of FP&A? Why are we seeing that that growth in content, content creators, and just you know that thirst for information? What do you think is driving that? So I think the the key thing driving that is that FP&A as a team or function, whatever we call it today, needs to do more. It's been said many, many times for the past at least five years, maybe 10 years even, that FP&A needs to do more. We need to be better at utilizing technology. We need to have more flexible and agile processes. Uh, we need to be better business partners, which of course is what, what we work with. So we need to deliver more value from the FP&A teams. And it's it's not happening at the scale that we want. And you can ask yourself, who's going to who's going to drive this? You know, you can have the big force of the world or other consulting companies trying to drive this, but why not practitioners? that have tried to do this. When I started sharing content, there was no practitioners, at least not on the LinkedIn space, maybe they were doing it on sites that I didn't visit, whatever, but there was no practitioners talking about what had they experienced as professionals, what had they learned, where had they failed, how did they succeed, sharing their experiences with an audience. They, they just, just weren't there or they were very, very difficult to find. So when there's no one sharing their stories, their experiences from a practical perspective, it's very hard for other professionals to learn because we need role models that we can see ourselves in, that we understand what did they do differently and that we can learn from. And I think a lot of uh, professionals such as yourself, Paul, right, and, and many others in this community are now seeing that, hey, you know, I don't need to be a big uh, VP or CFO or something like that to have an impact on a community or to be listened to. I just need to share my own stories, my tips, and my ways of doing things. And that's something people can learn from. Because most people, they're more eye to eye with you and me than they are with a CFO or VP, right? So if a VP shares how they did things 10 years ago, it's probably not relevant today. If they share how they run their pin team today, it's not relevant for the guys on the floor like you and me. Right? So they need to hear it from people that have done it, tried it, and are in it themselves. That's why it's happening now, and, and that's that's you know the burning platform for why we need to do it. No, that's a great point. And I, I agree with your point about delivering more value. You know, there's been areas where we've fallen down and not delivered enough value. And I'd like to come back to that here in a minute. But before they do that, I'd want to ask you just one more question, kind of around the content side. So maybe what are two or three topics that you find people are always most interested in? What do you find generally performs best? And I think I have a pretty good idea on at least one or two of those, but 
Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and share. It's kind of like a piece of software in five letters, right? Uh, called, uh, <laughs> That's the first one I was thinking of. Called Excel. Uh, if you share something with Excel, you know, whether it's, uh, it's just data analysis in Excel, macros, or, you know, something with, with, with power or something, it goes really, really well with that content. And of course, it's just uh, it's just a sign of how much Excel is used by FP&A teams. Whether we think that's a good thing or a bad thing doesn't really matter. It's a fact that it's being used so much. So Excel content is always doing really, really well. But I think also planning and forecasting content is also something that's that's doing well because we're all doing it and we're doing it for so such a big part of our our working hours that you know if we can get any tips of doing it faster or better or more impactful we'll, we'll take it so excel and planning and forecasting is, is great stuff for the fpna community yeah i, I would 100 percent agree with you on both those you know kind of funny story for me when i first started on linkedin you know, it was commenting and one of my first articles was 20, I want to say it was probably 2016, maybe early 2017, somewhere in that time frame. And uh, I wrote about Excel because I'd listened to a podcast by Lance Rubin where they argued whether Excel was dead or not. <laughs> and, you know, I didn't realize that people would just gravitate toward that. And it did really well for a first article and, you know, kind of like, oh, this is kind of cool. A lot of people are interested. I got comments and that part of kind of got me excited to try more and do more so I can definitely you know see the value of Excel and today I get it like you know I understand yeah. oh, that's why I chose the right subject you know, it wasn't what I necessarily wrote it was the subject resonated with people no but it, it's interesting so you know not counting my my current view counts on articles because now I have you know my biggest newsletter has 130,000 subscribers so you can't really compare but my most popular article to to date and there's been more than 600 of them on, on LinkedIn is the title uh, "Finance Business Partner versus Financial Analysis"? It's it's that simple, right? Because you know everyone is knowing what this financial analysis is all about, but what's this business partnering? And all I did in this article was basically looking at job description for each of them, and then then sort of comparing. And that article was you know, and articles you know they work differently than than posts in the feed, right? But it's yep. read, mm -hmm. I think, more than forty thousand times that that article, and it's it keeps being read and it's uh, ranked very well on, on Google and whatnot. So uh, there's a huge thirst for almost any kind of content that just has sort of an FPNA tune to it. But of course, those topics that sort of transcends from FPNA into other disciplines like Excel will always do better than pure FPNA content. Yep. Okay. So, so last question around the content, and then we'll get to some more things around specifically FPNA. But if there's somebody out there listening to you and they want to start, you know, posting content on FPNA, what's the top two or three pieces of advice that you would give them? So the first is wise is simply to get started, right? I mean, so many people yeah. think about it, but they don't get started, right? So get started so you can test what works, what resonates with your audience. I mean, if you don't start, you're never going to find out, right? And I think secondly is you all have experiences. You know, your experience is going to be different from my experience. And anyone out there is going to have their own unique experience. Share those experiences and people want to listen. You know, I, I followed a lot of uh, creators that have sort of risen on, on LinkedIn also lately here. And what they're doing is they're they're sharing their thoughts, their perspectives, their stories and it just it just resonates. So it's a great mm -hmm. time to just get started on LinkedIn now and just just use yourself. That's the best the uh, best you can do. No, I appreciate that. It's really it really does come down to get started and share who you are and your experiences and you know, I'll tell people, look, everybody's experiences are valuable. They're unique and somebody's going to want to hear them. It's just figuring out how to resonate and find your voice because every voice is going to be different. So that's that's great advice. You know what it is like, 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders, multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. 
DataRails takes data from all your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex, consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up-to-date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So, you know, can you maybe talk a little bit to our audience about the difference between kind of how to how they should think about FPNA versus business partnering? You talked about the article financial analysis. I know a lot of people have different views and some of that depends on where they are in the world and, you know, how they whether the role is how the roles are defined. But maybe from your perspective, especially having worked for, you know, the Business Partnering Institute and being so passionate about that, how do you think of an FP&A role versus business partnering? How are they different? How do they align? Talk a little to that. Yeah, so th the starting point is that FP&A is a team function slash department in the finance function, right? So there could be people doing financial planning analysis, but it's always a, a team. It's a group of people that do financial analysis, they do planning and forecasting and so on. So that it's, it's a group of people, it's, it's a team there. Business partnering, is an activity that anyone, someone in FP&A, someone in tax, someone in accounting, can do. And everyone should act as if they are business partners to someone. It might not be a business leader, it could be a finance leader, but you're still doing business partnering with, with someone, right? So it's an activity. The confusion might happen because then there's also some companies, more, let's say, in the uh, in, in, in Europe and in the, in the mm -hmm. UK world sphere, if you can call it like that, where it's a role, in a role in a company. And when it's a role, what typically happens is then FP&A is a corporate team of, I don't know, five to 10 people that supports the CFO, the CEO, and the board with you know, high-level company stuff. Whereas then the business partners, they're sitting out more in the front line, supporting like VPs and, and directors and whatnot with making key decisions in the company. So it's a more operational slash tactical role, whereas the FNA is tactical and strategic. Mm -hmm. So that that's how you sort of you would you would divide it if, if you have both roles. Um, so I fully get why there would be confusion, especially because it's not the same kind of like dictonomy across the world, it's all used differently. In the US, there's no finance business partner roles, right? In Denmark, for instance, FP&A would always just be this corporate team. So there's no uniform way of doing it across. So just remember, FP&A is a group of people, a team. Business partnering is an activity that you can never go wrong with. I think that's a great way to look at it. And I like that FP&A is kind of the department or team and business partnering is an activity. You know, it's also a, a mindset. Right. You know, it's something we all need to have no matter what role we're in, because for frankly, at the end of the day, we're supporting the business. And that's, you know, that's what partnering is about. So I think that's a great way to define that. So, you know, along those lines, you know, there's a lot of confusion around that. I think people have had. I also think there's sometimes a lot of confusion of what belongs in the FP&A department. You know, we all know there's some core functions. But beyond that, you see a lot of companies think very differently on you know what all is included in FP&A and you know what what should be included i think company size plays a, a role in that as well sometimes but what do you when you think of FP&A what are those core functions that you always you know believe should be part of FP&A uh, so i think if we talk about you know FP&A what should be part of it i think let's start by reminding ourselves what's the purpose of FP&A in general what is that what is the mission I don't know, I spent a lot of time trying to, 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 to define it also with, with other good FPNA professionals. And it really comes down to driving the right strategic choices in the company. So that's the starting point, right? So it starts at the strategic level, right? So you, you are part of this strategy process. You are part of outlining what choices can we make. You are part of making the decision to making those choices. So that, that's the starting point. From there, of course, it's about how do we then translate that strategy into the organization? And there, you know, you might have FPNA teams working with 
different finance teams down the down the road or different business teams. So that's you know translation needs to happen. But then FPA also needs to establish the feedback loop then from the front line of the company back to senior management and say, is the strategy working? So I think that, and I know that's a more holistic way of looking at it, but that's what FPA needs to do. And of course, that then involves uh, you know business cases, investment cases, planning and forecasting, management reporting, performance reviews, and so on and so on. But I think those are some of the key activities that will be done by by FPA. Um, and you know, there's no black and white in terms of what exactly needs to be in there, but the holistic approach drives our strategic choices, cascade it down, establish the feedback loop that needs to be there any day. Now, I, I like how you summarize that, and I think it makes a lot of sense that it's really about driving those strategic choices, you know, helping ish, ensure the strategic plan can be met through that feedback loop. You know, and that that's the core activity. And if, if you're doing that with that financial lens, you know, you're doing you're doing FP and A. Whether you know you're doing an annual budget, whether you're doing rolling forecasts, whether you're doing this or that, the real key is helping drive strategic value for the company. And so I think that's a, that's a great way to think of it. I think sometimes we get lost in, well, does this belong in FP and A? Should we be doing this? Should we be doing that? You know, and there's obviously a lot of opinions. I know you've you've talked about some of those things. And I think, you know, some of the challenges we're seeing these days are things such as, you know, data science, right? That's a hot, hot topic. Mm -hmm. Does that belong in FP&A? Does that, you know, where does that belong? How do they, they coordinate? And just data in general, data and analytics. I think you just had a series or you're going through a series on that. That's what you started with for your podcast. So maybe talk a little bit to that of how you think they're supposed to play together. How does, you know, data and analytics, kind of data science, FP and A, how does that all fit together? And what's your view of you know how a company should think about ensuring there's a coordination and collaboration there to you know achieve the goals? Yeah, so so it's all about the you know the data to insight journey, right? I think we a lot of people have, have talked about that. We all know the 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 last mile of the analytics marathon from from Brent Dykes and whatnot. But I think what what's key to understand is that what comes before data, what comes before data is a hypothesis around what needs to be true for our strategy to be right or for taking this action to be a good idea and so on and so forth. And I think that's what we often forget both in, in data analytics, but also in FPNA that we don't have a hypothesis around what needs to be true. So if we don't have that, we end up be just analyzing stuff forever and ever. And I think you, you've, you've mentioned it also earlier and, and I've, I've talked about it yet. We spend up to 70% of our time just working with the data, which obviously is not very, very efficient. And it's it's not no different between FPNA and and data analytics teams. I think I think it's pretty much the same. So I think we we all need the same starting point around. Okay, we have a business issue. It could be you know how do we execute the strategy or you know what choices should we make. We have a business issue. We need to have a hypothesis around what needs to be true, and then we analyze that, right? So that's the goal. And then sometimes the analysis might be very complex because there's lots of data sources involved or the volume of the data is huge. And there you need specialists who can really dig into the numbers. And a, let's say, general FP&A professional is not the right person to, to do that. But then there's the whole, we talked about it, you know, the strategy and the feedback room and all that. That's more, the analysis of it is pretty simple, but running it and interacting with stakeholders, that's where it gets a bit more difficult. That's why you need FP&A. That's not what the data analytics people are good at. So, they both have, you know, skills that sum up to the same thing, which is the data to inside journey. Um, but right now they're sort of more competing than they are collaborating because they're all sort of looking at, you know, lots of data and they're, they're sort of running towards getting to the inside piece, uh, piece first. But I think it's rather to understand that they have complementary skills where data analytics, they can really deep, go deep into stuff where if Pinay can more lie across. So if we have a business issue, we maybe sit together, all of us, to discuss with the business leaders, how do we address this? Sometimes it's simple. You just let FPNA run with it. Sometimes it's more complex. You put it into your data analytics team. They will do the, the deep dive, and the FPNA team will, will be there along with them to understand what's going on. And then they help translate that into business actions at the end of the day. And they'll follow up on if we actually get the desired outcomes from it. But if you ask the data analytics people to also be that you know, top layer, I feel that we're going to set them up for failure 
because then they lead to learn a lot of new skills, influencing, communication, and whatnot. And by all means, I see lots of data analytics professionals on LinkedIn talking about that they need to develop this as well. I just don't think it's the most efficient way of doing it. And I agree if data professionals also need to become better at communicating and influencing and all this stuff. But I think if we can have that division of labor to say data analytics, they go deep. If PNA, they, they, they go across. Then I think we're we're doing the right thing. And in order to do that, my take is that uh, data analytics should also be a team that sits in the overall finance function or in a center of excellence that could then, of course, also report into the CFO at the end of the day. But it should be housed under the same roof in order to ensure we use the resources in the best possible way and that we don't compete in a competition that no one wins. And you you answered where I was going to go next around the conflict. I, I can tell part of your solution to that is how it's structured and who owns it. Your view is data analytics, center of excellence, but really should roll into the CFO. And we're definitely seeing a lot more of that today. I mean, I'm sure you've seen some of the numbers. I believe this last year, 33% of CFOs were first time CFOs, people that are promoted, you know, more than ever, they've came from an FP&A and a data background, right? They need to be data savvy. Mm-hmm. You know, we've all heard the term and sometimes I cringe when I hear it. I'm sure, you know, I know you've written about it. I've written about it is, you know, digital transformation, right? Yeah. feels like we've heard that for a decade now. And so maybe just talk a little bit of your view about digital transformation. Why do you think companies struggle so much, so much with that? And what do you really think the key is around successfully, you know, making those transformations and really becoming, you know, data, digital, smart organizations? Yeah, it's it's, it's funny you mentioned this, uh, Paul, right? Because my my take on digital transformation and why it goes wrong is because most companies, they treat it like a strategy. Our strategy is to become digital. But but that, that doesn't say anything. Right, so they still have a whole transformation around. We need to become digital, okay? But what is it? Digital is supposed to enable, and that which it is supposed to enable, that is what should be your strategy. Being digital is just a means to to an end, right? But if you see digital transformation as your strategy, and I know, of course, you know, no one just has digital transformation as one strategy, but it could be one point out of four in a strategy, we need to be digital mm-hmm. in our company. That's that's just wrong because it's, it's not a strategy. It's something you do to enable something else. And if you're not clear about what that something else is, of course you're going to fail. But if you are clear about what digital is going to enable, that's when you can become hugely successful as a company. But I just feel like, you know, Digital transformation has become another one of those buzzwords that CEOs, not just CFOs, but CEOs are sitting there and saying, well, we need to have a digital transformation strategy as well because all the others are having it. And if we don't have it, we're probably going to fail as a company. Well, yes, I mean, most companies probably need to do something in the digital space, but that's not what, you know, you should sit there and decide in the strategy room. You should decide what choices are we making that's going to make us win in the market. And that's to maybe interact differently with our customers and okay to interact differently we need to be digital fair enough but if you don't know what digital is enabling you're going to fail so that's uh, that's my take on it no and and that makes a lot of sense and that aligns with we had uh francesca valley on the podcast you know and she's a digital transformation specialist and she studied a course around that at the uh, i think it was london school of economics i read read some data around them and they listed two th- two key things they found that are needed for successful digital transformation. And then she added her own third, which were kind of her three pillars. And the first one was strategy. It's like you talked about, you know, so many people look at technology as the solution. Technology is an enabler. It's never the solution. And, you know, if you think of it as the solution, you pretty much failed out the gate because it's just not the right way to think about it. It's how does it enable you? And so she talked about that strategy and then the second, she talked about change management, which I always like to sum up as, you know, communicate, 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 and then communicate some more because you can't over communicate. And then the third she talked about, which I think is a real challenge. And I think your data analytics and making sure that's set up right kind of speaks a little bit to that is getting your house in order, right? Cleaning up your data. Because if you don't, if you don't fix the data, at least enough that you can make good decisions, you know, the transformation isn't going to do you a lot of good. You can transform your processes and your system your systems, but if you don't fix the data, what good is it if what's coming out at the end doesn't add value? 
Yeah, but I mean, there's there's just so many issues with with the points you're mentioning here, right? We we talked about the strategy bit bit, bit already, uh, but it's just you know change management, for instance. Uh, have you ever heard about a function in a company that's greater change management? Maybe the change <laughs> management team, but they're never called upon in the right way to actually make a difference. We always underinvest in change management, and that's mm-hmm. why we fail with so many initiatives because it it, it takes a lot to succeed with change management. And we, you know, at, at BPI, we also work a lot with that, right? And we can always see that when companies don't invest enough in, for instance, a learning journey that we have, uh, we've set up with them, they're not going to get any benefits out of it. So it's, it's, it's just, it sort of dies there because we don't invest enough in the, in the change management. So it's, it's just issues all over the place with, with the points you mentioned there, Paul. And it's just, I get it. it. It's not easy. So I'm not just sitting here and saying everyone is stupid because they don't get it right. It is because it's difficult. But the challenge mm-hmm. is whenever something is difficult, we tend to overcomplicate it and then we never succeed. So we need to make it simple. Okay, what is it we're trying to achieve with being digital? Well, that's to change the conversation with our customers. Okay, let's build a digital interface that can help us do that. Simple. You know, We don't need, uh, you know, 20 different work streams to do that. We just need a fast work and agile team that can build a minimum of our product and then we go. Let's see how it works. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a great point about the over making things overly complex. It's easy to do. I know I've been guilty of it, and especially in finance, right? We've all seen those models that you open them up and you're like, where do I start? Even if they're well designed, sometimes they're so complex that you're just like, all right, I got 500 drivers. You know, which which one actually matters? I see you rolling your eyes because you've seen a few of those. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't know if I, I don't know if I've seen it so much myself, but I know I know they are out there, and I'm like, you can run, you can't run your business on 500 drivers. I mean, it's like the it's like the key in KPI always gets lost, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it should be PIs because you have performance indicators. You 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 don't have key and. I, and I see, uh, you know, again, because I've started following so many data analytics creators on LinkedIn, you know, I see a lot of them posting dashboards and they look really, really nice. Many of the dashboards that they make, and I, I couldn't make such a nice looking dashboard, but they always have seven or eight different things that they're tracking in one page. And my advice to them is always, you know, what are the two, three most important things that you want to track? Put those in your dashboard and then you can have some double click functionality and you can look at all the details. But if you can't choose the two to three, key performance indicators, forget about it. No one is going to get value from the dashboard. And it goes with so many other things in finance and FP&A that, uh, that we just cannot simplify and zoom in and say, these are the three most important things for our business. Let's drive those hard until we've succeeded and we pick the next one that's going to be important. Now, that's a great point. And you know, it, it really is. It's the key in key performance indicators. You know, I, uh, published the other day a cartoon you've probably seen it it's by a market tunist i think and it shows the big huge dashboard and there's one down at the bottom and they ask well what's this explaining it's like well that's the one that explains how well anyone understands this thing and it's just you know an arrow going down because they've just added so much stuff that it's like where do i start and some of them even end up conflicting sometimes like well if i focus on this it's going to impact this one over here in a negative way so where do i focus and so yeah you're that that's a great point of really you know, focusing on those few key things, those that really move the needle. And that's where sometimes a difficult conversation has to have happen because different people are going to have different opinions on what those key things are and that's okay. and what should really matter. That's okay. Those are the mm-hmm. thoughtful discussions that we should drive as yep. FPA professionals, right? I mean, we, we talk about the strategy, right? And it's about making choices. And I, I really buy mm-hmm. into the, to the McKinsey way of thinking here to say that there are probably five key things that you can do as a business. And if you want to move in terms of relative value created versus competitors for sure, but against all companies in the world, you need to do two of three of these, they call it big moves. And to make a big move, you have to really pull very, very hard on the steering wheel or you know, really uh, go hard on the throttle to, to get somewhere. And uh, most CEOs with their executive teams, they're not having those discussions. I mean, the, the strategy guru, Roger Martin, he basically said in a comment on one of my articles that only 10 to 15% of CEOs have a real strategy because they haven't made, haven't made choices. They're just doing stuff. 
They haven't made choices about why do we do this versus the other, and they're not pulling the wheel hard enough. And that's why FPA professionals have such a great opportunity to get in there, get in the mix, and actually change things. And uh, you know, it's 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 part of what I call the trillion dollar opportunity, mm-hmm. which is potential for value creation if FPA and associated teams can just get it right. It's massive, really massive. No, I agree. There's massive opportunity. When you said, you know, many companies don't have a strategy, I had a laugh because I had a situation where we got a new C- we got a new CEO at a company I worked with, and he had been there about two, three months and was very, very open with everybody. And we had a town hall. And he 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 said, you know, I still haven't found the company's strategy. If anyone's seen it laying around anywhere, if you could let me know, I'd appreciate it. Because, you know, he came in and said, there's no strategy here. I don't know what we're doing. And, you know, that was his first thing is trying to figure out what should be the strategy. You know, yes, we're making choices. And yes, we do a lot of tactical decisions, but we don't have a cohesive strategic you know, plan here. And that's that's so important. It really starts with that. Yeah. And FP&A needs to make sure they understand that and that they can drive toward that. And if it's not clearly defined, you know, that's not that. FPNA should bring that up. It's not FPNA's fault. You know, that's a leadership thing, but FPNA needs to be a part of helping solve that. And that's where opportunity gets unlocked. Well, I agree, Paul, that it's not FPNA's fault, but uh, I'd put it on FPNA if they don't. So uh, that's that. That's my challenge back, right? Because mm-hmm. that's what FPNA needs to do to make the CFO and the other CXOs happy with the return on investment that they're making in FPNA. You know, that's when a CEO would sit and say, well, you know, I'm not going to invest in 10 more sales rep next year. We need three more of those uh, FPNA folks because they know how to drive the right conversations and the right choices. And that is effing value creation in our, in our company, right? But we're not there today and, and maybe we won't be there for the next five or 10 years. Maybe we'll never be there. But if we can realize the, what we call people potential of FPNA teams, we can get there. But it's it's not easy. It it, it takes uh, it takes a lot of efforts. Yeah, no, and and I agree with you. It's something that FPNA should be doing. If it's not there, they need to be raising their hand and saying, "Look, this is what we need to do. We're missing this." So that you know, it's a great point. I can remember having some of those strategic discussions with the business and the value that can come from those. So uh, before we head, you know, I know we're getting close to kind of enter time, and I have a couple just kind of standard questions we ask everybody. But just want to ask one more question because I know this is an area that. You know, I've seen you know some very uh, passionate opinions from you about, and that's just around you know FPNA and learning, whether it's programming, SQL, some of those hard technical skills beyond Excel. You know, I've seen when you know mentioning you know finance people should learn basic, they should learn SQL. Your response has been no, you know that's not where they should focus. So maybe just talk a little bit about your thinking and that delineation there, because I know that's an area you're you have some pretty strong opinions on. Yeah, I think I think the first point to understand is the context in which you're operating, right? So if you're uh, a small FPNA team in a mid-sized company that you know you're the only ones basically doing data analysis in your company, and uh, you don't have a big IT function that can help you automate stuff and so on, it makes sense. It makes sense to learn, uh, you know, SQL or, or something like that because no one else is going to do it for you. Now, where I come from, of course, you know that that's big corporate, right? That's that's where I have worked. Um, so of course things are different, different there. And if I'm an FPNA professional in a in a you know big Fortune 500 uh, blue chip company, then absolutely not because you have data analytics teams, for instance, that are really good at this. You as an FPNA professional, you need to be the good at communicating, influencing, driving the right discussions, driving the right choices, all this stuff. And that doesn't require SQL. I can guarantee you that, right? You know, just. Sh- revamping your management reporting is actually something you'll get a lot more value out of because what I see mostly is, is just really not that good, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of other things that you can focus on that's going to be much more value adding for you. So we have to remember the context. So I mostly reply from a big company context, whereas other creators may, might be looking at it from a medium-sized, even small-sized uh, company context. And, and it is it is different. But I think if you look at the uh, archetypical FPNA professional does SQL and you know coding languages belong in there? I don't think so. Yeah, no, and I understand what you're talking about between the big and small company. Although I will say I learned SQL in a Fortune 500 company, but as a general rule, I agree with you. That's not that's not the norm. My my situation was a little unique of how that came about, but 
you know, I found a ton of value in it in FPA and having that skill. But I understand what you're saying and, you know, company size and how it's structured makes a difference. If you're never going to be the one pulling the data, then I get it, you know, focus your time elsewhere. So, you know, there's definitely a context element to that as there is to almost any discussion. Yeah. And the thing, the thing for me is, uh, is, is also, let's say you have one in the team that can do it. They'll build some solutions, but then that person leaves and then no one really knows how to do it. I always make the analogy of, you know, all the Microsoft access, right? But you can also build some pretty amazing uh, databases, but there was always just this one person that knew how it worked. And when that person left, because you know, people always leave for different reasons, then it, it wasn't useful anymore, right? So I know, you know, SQL, for instance, is probably a bit more uh, flexible to work with than, than access, but I just don't want FPA teams to end up in that situation where someone has built something, but no one else need, knows how to operate it. You know, they know how to operate Excel, so they can probably fix a financial model in Excel, but if they can't fix the database because there are some errors in it, and, and then then all the, the work is wasted. So I just don't think it's, I just don't think we are suited for that kind of work. If you really want to do that, go towards the data teams, right? They work with that and they're specialists and they're really good at that. And those are the ones we should be getting this help from. And if you're not because you don't have the team or because they are too busy, maybe like what you experienced, uh, Paul, back in your unique situation, then by all means, you will be getting some value out of it. It's just not what's going to make you successful in your FPNA career. I can guarantee you that. Sure. It's not going to be the most valuable thing. You know, I'm a fan of everybody at least learning the basics because I think it, it helps, but I understand where you're coming from and I can, I can appreciate that. I know there's, you know, some, some thought behind that and I get, I get the rationale. Just the last point on it, Paul. I think mm-hmm. I, sure. I agree with you in the sense that you need to know what's possible with these uh, tools and, and coding languages, because if you don't know what's possible, then how are you ever going to be able to uh, get the right help from the teams that actually know how to do it? So you need to be, a, be a, what I call a techno, right? So you need to be no mm-hmm. more possible with technology. It doesn't mean you can do it yourself, but you know who to turn to and you know what's the potential benefit for the team and the, the company. Yeah, and, and I agree. Every FP&A professional needs to at least speak the technical language. You know, obviously my background, I did a Master of Science in Information Management. I started doing report writing. So I came from a more technical background and it's been invaluable for me. And that's why I encourage people to go down that. But I agree, you know, obviously the more you get promoted, the more you move up, the less you're going to be doing technical things. And at the end of the day, you know, even if you have great technical skills, if you can't partner, if you can't dr- drive the strategic decisions, you're you're hurt you're hurting and limiting the business. So it's finding, you know, where to spend your limited resources. Yeah. So I can, you know, I can totally get where you're coming from on that on that discussion and I always think it's fun to see because Everybody has a little different view and a lot of it's shaped by our backgrounds, right? That's, you know, that's just reality of what companies we worked for and, you know, what we prioritize. And so it's, you know, that, that discussion will go on forever. I'm sure <laughs> we'll be having it in 10 years from now on LinkedIn. Yeah. So, uh, you know, here's a question for you. As you look over your career, what would you classify as maybe your biggest achievement? If you're in a job interview and someone asks for, you know, your kind of biggest finance achievement, what would be your answer? I guess my answer is that I, I finally succeeded with business partnering. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I learned about it in uh, in a, in a a late April day in 2010. I think it first probably the first time I heard about it. And uh, when I finally succeeded with it for real, I mean, looking at it, at it in hindsight, it's like uh, early 2019. Right? So it, it took me uh, 10 years and I'm I'm proud of the fact that I cracked the code and I was able to do it at the end. And now I can help others doing it. but you know, trying something for 10 years before you really become good at it. Maybe that's just how life is, right? Because it, it takes mm-hmm. time to really become an expert in something. But uh, that's that was a great sense of achievement. And once I cracked the code, I could do something in three weeks that maybe would have taken me three years, uh, just a few years earlier. Uh, so that's, that's definitely something I'm proud of. I never made it high up in the corporate ladder or anything like that, but I cracked that code and I feel if I can help you know, thousands of other finance professionals across the world crack that code too. That's uh, that, that's pretty darn good. No, I mean, that's something to be proud of and that's great. I know you're helping people crack that code and you found something you're passionate about. So, you know, that that that's what matters, not necessarily climbing the corporate ladder, as we like to say. So we've talked about, you know, greatest achievement, but as you look at your career, what's maybe one of the uh, biggest mistakes or kind of challenges that you've learned from, right? We all have them. And I like to say, 
you know, failure leads to success or, you know, failure is an opportunity to learn. So maybe kind of a mistake or if you want to call it a failure that you've learned from. Yeah, it's, it's probably not a mistake per se, right? But I mean, the, the biggest failure in my in my career has pretty much been to stay within my comfort zone for too long and for too many times. So there's been so many, you know, that's also part of the reason why it took me so long to see the business partnering because business partnering for most finance and FNA professionals is outside their comfort zone. It's certainly, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty odd that I was going to go down this route because for me, it was pretty far outside my comfort zone. Uh, but there, there's just, you know, looking back at my career, there's just so many examples where I said, I should have gone to that meeting, but I didn't. I should have engaged more with these these insights, but I didn't. I should have done this. I should have done that, but I chose not to because, yeah, you know, then 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 is then I don't have to put myself out there. And I think uh, this is not unique for me. I think it's it goes for many different uh, penny professionals out there. And now I try to make it my mantra to to step out my my comfort zone every day if I get a chance to to do it. Maybe I don't succeed every day because that opportunity is not there. But, you know, everyone, step outside your comfort zones. That's where life begins. Now, that's a great, that's great advice. And you're not the first one who said that on the podcast. We've had others talk about the importance of stepping outside your comfort zone. And I can say, you know, having done that and starting my own business, it's been a great experience. You know, it definitely has helped me grow. So I would echo what you've said there. So now we'll get to the question we ask everybody. And there's two of them. We'll start with the first one here. What is something that people don't know about you? Something they wouldn't find online? Something unique about Anders? I think I think there's probably many things, but there was a there's a fun fact popping up. Uh, I think it was like two weeks ago. So uh, so one of our other partners at BBI, he goes to one of our clients, and they are doing a training program out there. And then he uh, then he sends me a message on Teams with the rest of the management team also, and say, Anders. When uh, when were you on this dating show? And I'm like, who knows about me being on a dating show? Because that you cannot find anywhere online. Uh, <laughs> but, but the back the backside to the story is that I once auditioned to uh to a to a dating show. Uh, I never made it uh, made it in there. Uh, but obviously, some former Maersk colleagues who now worked in the in another company, they sort of. I probably told them at one point and uh, then they were sort of telling this story. So you can find it out there that I auditioned for a dating show once. Great. Well, you know, can we find the audition? Can we see that? No, I, I, I hope it's been destroyed. At least it would be against GDPR rules to, uh, to keep it here in Europe. <laughs> That's true. Maybe it's somewhere here in the U S we can hope. No. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I know we're at the, our top of our hour. So we'll end with this question. What is your favorite Excel function and why? Yes, I've been I've been anxiously watching many of the episodes here to see what kind of uh, functions people come up with. I don't know if it's it's been taken yet and uh, maybe my reasoning for picking that one is pretty pretty simple compared to what others would say, but my my favorite Excel function at least right now is XLOOKUP um, which obviously has replaced the VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP for, for 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 many professionals. It's not available to everyone still, and that's why there's still debate on which which approach you should use, uh, but why why XLOOKUP? And the simple reason is that it was so simple to start using. You know, I uh, again ten years ago I tried to to start using Index Match, which is a better you know technical solution compared to VLOOKUP, for instance. Um, and I I did manage to get it to work, but I didn't manage to get it into my routines. With XLOOKUP, you know, all I did one day was just to type X instead of V. And I didn't have to think about it. I could just work with it. And I think that's that's why it's my favorite Excel function, at least uh, at least right now, because it's rare that you come across Excel functions you can just plug and play like that into your work. And I need to lose, use a lot of lookup functions. We don't lose a lot of data analysis in our company, obviously, so we don't need to build big databases and everything. So it's simple lookups, and XLOOKUP is just much much easier to use than VLOOKUP, so that's why I switched to that. And it was just so easy to get into. No, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I'm a big fan of XLOOKUP and I'll teach it in my training and corporate training when I'm doing Excel. And you can see some of the light bulbs go on when they realize how easy it is and the benefits it has, yeah. where it doesn't, you know, it doesn't break in certain ways without coming up with a complex solution. Everybody's like, well, you can solve it this way. It's like, yes, but the average user isn't going to think of, oh, here's how I make it backward compatible. And here's how I do this and that. And 
It's like, no, you want to keep it simple. So I, I agree with you on that. So what, as we wrap up here, just any last uh, parting advice you'd give your, give our audience or anything you'd like to, to say, maybe where they can find you or just any, any th- last thoughts? I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they know where to find me, right? Which is just on, <laughs> on, on LinkedIn. Uh, but, uh, you know, great, uh, great podcast, Paul, great show that you're doing here and, and lots of great work you're doing for, for the FPA profession. And, uh, I really just love that we have so many more people like yourself that are now getting, uh, getting into this. So I think my parting advice would go follow Paul and go follow all the other creators out there because they have great stuff to, uh, to share too. So, uh, don't, uh, don't, don't cheat yourself out of that. Well, thank you, Anders. I appreciate that. We'll go ahead and end on that note, but thank you again for making time for us. And I'm excited for our audience to listen to this podcast. Thanks for having me, Paul. You're so welcome. 